Hey guys, Steve here, and last time we trekked through Pokemon Blue with not Butter the Butterfree. Butterfree landed itself in the B tier of my list with a final time of 142 real time, 513 game time, and level 59 with 18 resets. This run is going to be Porygon. Yes, that's right, everyone's favorite 9,999 coin digital duck. Like, who at some point in their childhood was like, this Pokemon is the max amount of coins, it must be good. Then you get to it, and it's only a measly level 26 with relatively low stats and bad moves. It's time to run everyone's favorite disappointment. Porygon has base stats totaling 385. However, Porygon is a normal type, making its weaknesses much fewer than most Pokemon at just fighting types. The learn set is quite good as well, but what it makes up for in moves, it loses in just awful speed. Having low speed is a double-edged sword too, because I will crit much less often, resulting in not being able to use luck nearly as much. As always, my blue runs will be using the Gen 1 blue version, with Pokemon selected at random from the end of my previous video, unless I can get enough commenters to give me suggestions. The rules are the same, I will only be allowed to use one Pokemon, the other Pokemon will only be there for HM purposes and not allowed to be used in battle. No glitches or exploits except the badge boost glitch and Marowak skip. No items used within battle. Lastly, no using double team until the run seems absolutely hopeless. I will do my best, but I will make plenty of move and routing mistakes. However, I will get better over time, so please be kind and let me know of any advice you may have to speed up my runs in the future. I am writing this script after the run. Please try and guess in the comments section how quickly I am able to beat the game and how well you think it may perform at certain points of the game. Please make sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for future videos. First off, we're going to start the game by grabbing our level 5 Porygon and replacing Bulbasaur with the Universal Pokemon Randomizer to make sure the rival has a Charizard. The Porygon can't learn any rock or water moves to take advantage of Charizard's greatest weaknesses. Charizard is also the fastest of all the starters, which will be a big problem for the slow Porygon. I give it the nickname Polygon because this is the best I could come up with and I didn't want to use something like Digital Duck. I make sure to pause the game and reset Porygon's stats to give it perfect DVs before starting. We start off our Rival 1 battle with a Sharpen because it gets us to a consistent 2 hit KO. Unlike my previous runs, I battle every Pokemon along the way to Viridian City so I can heal after Oak's Parcel and not visit Viridian City again. Then I work my way along slowly using all my PP and picking up all the items in Viridian Forest. After about 2 cycles through using my Tackle PP, I find myself at about level 12 and a half. I decide that the Light Years Trainer and Brock's Gym should get me to level 13, which is what I desired to take on Brock. After doing three test runs before this one against Brock, I decide that level 14 is consistent and level 12 is impossible. So I'm going in at 13, and it will require a bit of luck. We make our way to Brock, the Geodude comes out first, and the setup is always the same at the start of Brock. We start with a conversion to become Rock Ground Type, to resist the normal type moves made by both Geodude and Onyx. Then we set up our maximum of 6 Sharpens. These Sharpens won't actually help us a whole lot during the Geodude battle because of all the defense curls it sets up during the course of the battle. However, we set up these Sharpens to get a slight advantage before it sets up all of its 6 defense curls, and so we have a major advantage during Onyx. The strategy for Onyx is somewhat simple and quite luck based. If Onyx uses Bide, we switch to Sharpen, and if it uses anything else, we go to Tackle. The problem is, we go second. So if it does use Bide, there's nothing we can do to stop the damage from the first hit. The Geodude does eventually go down thanks to a spam of tackles, and we get a bit of luck going into Onyx at 33 HP. Onyx comes out and we get a first turn Bide, which is very bad. After the first Bide, we take about 8 damage, which means we can deal about 4 damage. As you can see in the top right, the Onyx has a maximum HP of 36, and this means that we have to land 9 hits or get a crit at some point. Onyx gets another bite off for its third attack and we are going to take another 8 points of damage. Immediately followed by another bite so we're not getting a lot of damage in and taking a lot back. At this point I trade moves until it goes down to the last second bite and on the second attack I manage to land the finishing blow getting us the boulder badge and a further increase of my attack stat by 12.5%. As we make our way through Mount Moon I want to use this time to talk about my new strategy going forward for these videos. On Friday, I plan on streaming two attempts, and on Saturday, I plan on streaming another two attempts. 
During these attempts, I want to mold out a strategy so that on my 4th or 5th attempt, I can get the run you see in front of you. One thing that I realized during these practice runs is that my Dig slash Cut Pokemon are usually Paris or Sandshrew. However, of these two, Paris cannot learn Strength, which changes the way I have to approach Fuchsia City. Anyways, we make our way through the fossil section, and I decide to show my praise towards our Lord and Savior Helix and grab the Helix fossil. Once we arrive in Cerulean City, I decide that for my practice attempts, Misty is close, but not doable at this level. With that said, I decide to start with the rival. There's not much strategy here, Pidgeotto is a nightmare for most Pokemon to deal with. It never goes down in one hit, and has one of the greatest moves in the game in Sand Attack. The first Pokemon out is Pidgeotto, and it knows to start with Sand Attack, resulting in the next two misses, and puts us in bad shape. Somehow, we manage to make our way through Pidgeotto, and with two Sand Attacks and 16 HP, I'm not too optimistic. Abra doesn't know any moves other than Teleport, as you can see in the top right. So, I set up six Sharpens to try and sweep through Rattata and Charmander. Unfortunately, Rattata manages to land a critical hit quick attack for 10 damage, but we do manage to land our tackle despite two Sand Attacks. Charmander comes out and gives us a growl, and Sand Attack catches up to us, and Charmander does take us out for our first reset. On attempt number two, we manage to get through Pidgeotto without taking a Sand Attack, but at much lower HP. We set up as usual on Abra and finish it off with a tackle. Rattata is next, and it shows that it's a crit machine and takes us down to 5 HP before going down. Charmander is next, and it outspeeds and hits us with a scratch to end the run. Try number three is an interesting one. I decide that maybe I should consider using a Sharpen to see if it will reduce the amount of hits needed to take it out. We get a pretty lucky roll and manage to take it out relatively easily with 34 HP this time and set up on Abra as usual. We go into Abra with much more HP and 3 Sand Attacks. This could go any way, but not today as we manage to land a first hit tackle and move on to Charmander with much more HP than usual. After one miss and one ember, we manage to land our next attack and get a lucky one-shot on Charmander. Normally, I would skip to Misty, but Nugget Bridge was a real struggle this time, and I'll show you why. There's a hiker at the bridge who guards the elixir. Here's the battle. I choose not to heal before starting the hiker, and the Machop brings us down to 11 before the Geodude. Geodude comes out and I convert to Rock Ground type, but unfortunately that's not enough to get the Geodude down to 1 HP for each attack. I attempt to set up, but it's futile, as I go down for reset number 3. Oh, but that's not all. On my very next go, through Nugget Bridge, I do the exact same thing. Maybe you guys should leave me a comment to save more often. Then I might get it through my thick skull and not lose so much on the easier fights. As we make our way to Misty, you may need to shield your eyes for this one. I stream these attempts, and when I get frustrated, or I'm dealing with chat, I get quite a bit mistake prone. Sometimes I hold Rapid Fire A too long while reading chat. Anyways, I start the battle with Conversion and two Psybeams. On the surface, this looks like a good play, but I forget to set up the Sharpens on this run. I make my patented Hold A too long play and start off Starmie with a Psybeam, and it does next to nothing. Thanks to my conversion, Starmie is just going to continue to use Tackle for the rest of the battle. She won't use any water moves against a water type. Anyways, this is hard to watch. Just take a look at the battle and judge it accordingly. Through a mixture of non-powered up tackles and then sharpens, I eventually tackle the Starmie down. There's no way I deserve this victory. As we make our way through the SSN, I'd like to talk about the elephant in the room. The new layout you see on screen is quite a bit different from my previous two videos. I've improved all the boxes and added statistics. I'm a stats guy, and I appreciate them very much and I hope you guys do too. I hope this setup looks good to you guys because I've spent a large portion of my last week trying to improve the content you see on screen. I think it's fascinating to see what kinds of stats Pokemon have, and I cannot be alone here. You hear plenty of YouTubers say things like, I'm going to use Body Slam because Jinx has terrible defense, but have you ever actually looked up how much defense a Jinx has? Neither have I. With this new program, you'll see on screen developed by Scott's Thoughts and the Game Hub team, you can see everything you've ever wanted. Anyways, I will refer to movesets and stats constantly here on the channel, and now you know exactly why I made these choices. On to Rival 3. The Bonehead in me enters the battle without using any potions I'm supposed to attain from the Vermilion Mart. I start at Pidgeotto with a single Sharpen that I learned from the Rival 2 battle, and I am able to finish off with Pidgeotto. On to Raticate, and with 24 HP, there's just no way I'm going to go through all of these Pokemon with one sand attack, right? I switch to Psybeam, forgetting that I set up one Sharpen before Raticate. 
Kadabra comes out and we get a lucky teleport and one-shot it. Is this really happening? Last up is Charmeleon and we get a really solid tackle and we're just one more away from victory. But after two scratches we succumb to defeat and reset once again. Practice makes perfect and I remember to heal up before the start of the next battle. Pidgeotto comes out and I start out with another Sharpen and Pidgeot misses Sand Attack this time. Two tackles is too much for the bird to handle and things are looking really good. Raticate comes out and gets off a Tail Whip and Hyper Fang, which is a pretty good strategy for the AI. However, it doesn't stop the two tackles from taking it out. Kadabra gifts us with another lucky teleport despite knowing confusion. Charmeleon hits us with an Ember and a Mist Growl before finally going down. Take a look at our HP. We took exactly 40 HP. Good thing I healed this time. One short journey later to Vermilion Gym and we make it to Surge without too much hassle. Someday, I'll remember how much HP I have left. But, for now, we're gonna start Surge at 42. The Voltorb starts off with us going for a confusion to copy its electric typing. We take a sonic boom in return and that's just plain painful. Two side beams later and the Voltorb finally goes down. Pikachu is next and we start with a very powerful tackle. The next one doesn't do nearly as much because of the growl we took on turn 1. Surprisingly Pikachu goes down while only landing a quick attack. Raichu is next and we get hit by a pretty devastating thunderbolt and our Psybeam doesn't do much in return. We go into the next attempt at full strength this time as I remember to heal. We start off the next battle with a sharpen and two tackles. Surge just uses X speed and a miss gets us through to Pikachu. Pikachu doesn't do much but lands a Thunder Wave, which will slow us down if we get fully paralyzed. Raichu starts off with a pretty strong Thunderbolt, and it's looking to be very close. But a few bad decisions later, and we get through the gym, and get me the Thunder Badge, and a permanent 12.5% upgrade to my defense. As we make our way through this portion of the game, I'd like to ask a question. Did anyone else feel like Rock Tunnel was the halfway point of the game? Maybe this is just me, but during my childhood, and even now, once I get through the cave, I feel like the game is close to being over. I have nothing to back up this opinion, and even my videos show this is obviously false, but it's just a strange feeling that I get. I get this feeling a lot while driving to places too. I make my way directly to Erica with a sub-optimal moveset, but from my testing I learned that I just want to keep Psychic for later. So, I can remove Psybeam later for Rival 5 if I need to. Erica's trainers make good training and aren't all that hard with Psybeam anyways. We make our way through Erica and I save knowing that Victory Bell is a major challenge. I remember to heal up, the battle starts and I head directly for Psybeam. But we are 4 speed too slow and I get hit by a sleep powder and just do not ever wake up again. On the very next attempt, Victory Bell starts with Razor Leaf, which thanks to a Gen 1 mechanics will always be a critical hit. Our Psybeam lands and it appears that it will be a 3 hit KO. Victory Bell lands a 3 turn wrap, then it misses the next wrap and we land another Psybeam and get a lucky confusion. Victory Bell then lands the next wrap and after that it appears the falling wrap has to go through another confusion check and fails. Luckily, the next attempt also fails and it takes itself out. The tangle of battle is just impossible to narrate. When I have recover, this is not a matter of if I can take it out, but when. After a much longer than expected amount of attacks, I finish off Tangela, but only leaving me with two side beams remaining. Vileplume is next and it outspeeds me. It hits me with a Mega Drain. It doesn't do much, but the next Petal Dance does in fact do a lot of damage. In hindsight, Tackle could have done enough damage and the next Petal Dance would finish me off. Luckily, it doesn't and I get the Rainbow Badge. After a quick visit to the Celadon Mart, I head over to Rival 4. At this point, we should be overleveled for this battle, and there should be a heal coming up soon, so I speed through the battle as best I can. The rival starts off with a Pidgeotto, and I just tackle three times, and thanks to outspeeding, I only get a single gust. On Execute, I set up two Sharpens before using Tackle. In hindsight, I could have just set up the entire six, because Execute has nothing but Barrage and Hypnosis, which I didn't know at the time. I was worried about getting seated, and just tried to finish it off quickly. Gyarados is a two-shot and even Hydro Pump doesn't do that much damage at this level. Kadabra is an even quicker one-shot. Charmeleon another two shots. However, I do want to point out, while editing this video, I did notice that Charmeleon has rage during this battle. I don't ever remember getting hit from it from the rival at any run I have ever played in the past. Not much of note in the rest of Ghost Tower, but I'll just highlight the Marowak skip just in case someone doesn't know how to do it. 
You just head into the item selection and use a Poke Doll during battle. Then the battle ends and the spirit is rested. The rest of the solo challenge community doesn't consider it a glitch and neither do I. As we finish up in Ghost Tower, I just want to go over the badge boost glitch real quick. I passed up on a move called Agility, which raises your speed up by two stages, something Porygon desperately needs. Pokemon gives you a boost to your stats that you cannot see every odd number badge. Brock gives attack, Surge gives defense, Koga gives speed, and Blaine gives special. All your change stats get boosted again, so Sharpen will increase my attack 50% as intended, but also increase my defense unintentionally at this point in the game. The extra boost gets fixed if you level up, so if you rely on this stat increase, you don't want to level up. I am terrible at spacing out timing and level ups, so this run I decide to keep Sharpen instead of Agility. If I accidentally level up, after setting up 6 sharpens, the increase my attack will still exist and benefit me more than the added speed from agility. Anyways, back to the game, I head directly south to get and teach Swift. It's very useful against Koga, who loves to spam smokescreen. I then make my way through Cycling Road and quickly go through the Safari Zone, making sure to pick up the important vitamins along the way. We make our way through Koga's gym rather easily, having an okay normal move that does neutral damage to the Drowsy and Hypno. I only point this out because all the Pokemon that I've done on the channel have struggled against these two Pokemon. I head directly for Koga, unfortunately without healing. First up is Coughing, and I start to set up a future Swift with Sharpen. Now we do get poisoned against Coughing, but this isn't actually that bad, as it seems, because it's better than being toxic poisoned. After healing up, I make sure to finish off the Coughing with a Swift, because Psybeam will be incredibly inaccurate thanks to all the smoke screens. Muck is next, and two Swifts easily takes it out. The next coughing doesn't last very long either. Going into Weezing at 71 is a bad idea, so I use Recover on the first turn just in case of a self-destruct. Now, from the other runs I learned with an X attack, I can be one shot regardless of HP. The strategy is now switch to Swift and cross our fingers for no self-destructs. After a sludge and a smog, we are victorious and have ourselves a soul badge in an additional 12 and a half percent to my speed. While I was working my way through Sylphco, I want to explain something I mentioned earlier in this run. But in all my previous runs with agility, I usually teach over recover with Thunderbolt. However, this sharpen strategy has been so effective, I actually open the menu to get ready to try Thunderbolt and then decide to just see how it'll go if I keep recover instead. I figure I would most likely get hung up around Gyarados, but I still wanted to try. Anyways, Rival Fievel starts off with Pidgeot, and I again also don't heal starting with a disadvantage. However, the strategy for the rival battle is quite a bit different from my previous practice attempts. I have Swift this time instead of Tri-Attack, as well as Sharpen instead of Agility. An idea pops into my mind. Pidgeot comes out and I set up with 6 Sharpens. During this setup, I'm hit with a Quick Attack and 2 Sand Attacks, which isn't that bad since I didn't remove Recover this time for Thunderbolt. For once, I don't need to worry about accuracy and Swift is just a one hit. Execute is also another one hit, followed by a one shot of Gyarados, the reason I usually use Thunderbolt. Alakazam is next and it does outspeed me, especially since I leveled up, but thanks to the useless recover, it does go down in one hit as well. Charizard outspeeds as well, but only goes for a rage. To be honest, I don't think it would have taken out my 90 HP, but Slash does always crit, so we'll never know. Giovanni is next, and it starts with Nidorino. I was low on HP, and luckily I outsped, and went for recover. Now I'm going to pause here, but I just wanted to point something out. I was worried about one thing in this fight, double kick. Take a look at this, where's double kick? Anyways, I set up my 6 sharpens and go for side beam. Despite being weak to psychic moves, my attack is probably high enough Swift would have finished it off. Kangaskhan is next, and at this point, I remember Scott's thoughts video, and Kangaskhan has some of the most horrific special you've ever seen. So I use another side beam, and it does a lot less damage than half. I probably should have switched to Swift at this point, but I'm either spamming A too fast or just too stubborn to switch. Next up is Rhyhorn, and take a look at this. Its special is actually lower than its own level. I found that very funny. I notice this, and I get curious if I'm able to win with a single side beam and it's not like it has any other moves that can make this battle go badly for me. A critical hit happens and it still doesn't go down. It's not like Swift would have worked anyways, as Rock resists normal moves and its defense is actually quite high. 
as Nitto Queen comes out, I'm still spamming Psybeam. In hindsight, after reviewing the footage, with 6 sharpens at 300% and 60 base power of Swift, it would end up being stronger than the 2 times effective base power 65 special beam. But you know, you learn. In my testing, I always make it to the league underleveled, and my next goal is Sabrina. So I make a pit stop at the fighting dojo to take care of all the fighting types with my replenished Psybeams. Unfortunately, I do take a high jump kick from the last hit only, and I have to use 2 super potions before fighting Sabrina. Out first is Kadabra, and this speed demon can put you in a bad spot for Alakazam. So I waste no time in using Swift, without setting up against it. I get pretty lucky, and thanks to Disable and a Recover, I get by without being hit. Next up is Mr. Mime, and this is my setup target, and that's exactly what I do. After the setup, I get a recovery in for good measure, but a critical hit confusion makes me recover again. But the next turn is the same as the last, and there's no reason to be hasty, so I just recover again. Two Swifts are enough to finish it off. Venomoth doesn't last very long with our badge boosted speed and increased attack. One Swift is more than enough to deal with its frail exterior. As Alakazam comes out, you get a good chance to see the badge boost in action, as our 68 speed Cyber Duck outspeeds its 115 speed Mustachioed Glass Cannon. We make it through Sabrina and get ourselves the March badge. After a quick pit stop to give the Warden his gold teeth, we grab strength and make our way to the Pokemon Mansion. Pokemon Mansion typically isn't any sort of roadblock or anything, and it still isn't. My frustrations grew as I ran out of room in my bag, and I'm constantly having to open to use or throw away items. This cost me a lot of time, and I even managed to use a Carbos on Lapras instead of Porygon because the last Pokemon I was using was Lapras for Surf. I even drop Ice Beam for Blizzard, as I decide against Ice Beam because sometimes it's a range on the Pokemon in the league. Next up is Blaine, and if you saw the Sabrina battle, then you probably have a good idea how this battle is going to go. I set up 6 Sharpens, heal for good measure, and the Swift goes through the team, earning us the Volcano Badge and a 12.5% boost to my special. At this point, I get pretty excited because I'm very far ahead of my previous runs, and things have been going a lot smoother thanks to Sharpen instead of Agility. There's almost no time between Blaine and Giovanni, so we'll head right into that battle. Rhyhorn comes out, and we set up our 6 Sharpens. I test out a Swift for good measure since Psybeam didn't do the job last time. It confirms my suspicions, and the following Psybeam takes it out. As Doug Trio comes out, I just use Swift. Hold on, did he just dig? Enemy Doug Trio dug a hole, but Swift still hit him. That is awesome, and that's good to know in the future. As Nidoqueen comes out, I'm still under the assumption that Psybeam is better, because Poison is weak to psychic moves. I honestly don't know if it would have been a one-shot, but I just have to remember these things in the future. Nidoking is much of the same, two Psybeams. However, it did poison me, and I'm on the lower side of my HP. As Rhydon comes out, I realize that it's probably going to be an easy victory. I get off a recover and just spam Psybeam for the rest of the battle. One thing to note is that it has two one-hit KO moves. Like, why? The Earth Badge allows me entrance into Victory Road. One quick heal later and it's off to the champ, before he fulfills his destiny of becoming the champ for all of about what, 10 minutes? I do much of the same and set up our 6 sharpens on Pidgeot and swift it down. Rhyhorn doesn't get much screen time as it appears it goes down to a single side beam. This means Giovanni's would have gone down in one hit too. Oh well. Execute gets an unfortunate crit, as crits don't account for your stat boosting moves, so a crit would only do 200% rather than the 300% we already set up. As Gyarados comes out, we're poisoned, but this shouldn't be a big deal because we plan to one-shot everything. Gyarados is no different as it goes down to one swift. But, we level up, so we're not going to have even a sliver of a chance of outspeeding the Alakazam now. Alakazam comes out and it goes first with a critical hit Psychic, and we have to go down for another reset. Not every battle can go our way, so we trot over for a rematch. The next battle starts out the same way, but we go into Alakazam without poison. It goes for recover, and we take it down. This brings us up against Charizard, who we should one-shot like the rest. Nope. But, a potion pretty much makes it like a one-shot. As I approach the Elite Four, it's time to start setting up from prior experience. I get rid of our tried and true Swift for a much needed Thunderbolt. I also level up to 53 because I determined that this was a good and consistent level to enter Lorelei at. I did set up our Sharpens, and even though I don't have a physical move anymore, I did use a rare candy before this battle, eliminating the threat of a level up. Thunderbolt is more than Dugong can handle, and it goes down in one hit. 
Cloyster is next, and you can see just how lopsided its stats are, as our special move that's two times effective in Thunderbolt takes care of it in one hit. Next up is Slowbro, and I don't typically one-shot it with anything, but today, that changes as Thunderbolt does take care of it. Next up is Jinx, and there's just no way we one-shot it, since we don't have a physical move anymore, and it's not weak to electric moves. But badge boosts have made us a lot more bulkier, and we just get two Thunderbolts off and take care of it. Lapras is weak to Thunderbolt, but with 120 special and 220 HP, it will certainly be able to tank a Thunderbolt. It does, but a retroactive super potion makes this an easy victory. Bruno isn't even worth the narration. There's no real way of screwing this up. Just use some sort of mixture of Sharpen and Psybeam, and this battle will be won. Sometimes, I even debate if I should even show Bruno when it's this easy. It was at this time that I realized I forgot to pick up Psychic for Agatha. So now I'm forced to use Psybeam on our Pokemon. In my previous attempts, I had taught Psychic before Erica, and I just simply forgot about it. Anyone that's seen challenge videos before knows that Agatha is quite difficult for any Pokemon that cannot outspeed hers. Porygon is no exception, so the Gengar comes out, and from the get-go, it goes for the jugular and takes me out while I'm setting up. The next attempt goes much of the same way. As I know from my previous attempts, I need to set up at least a little bit to get the Gengar within two-shot range. So for the first few turns, we're a sitting duck as our moves are quite good against us. It's not too long before we make it to attempt number three, and here, things decide to finally go right. Gengar comes out, and my rush for a good time, I leave the rapid fire A a little too long and start with a thunderbolt, and get a lucky paralysis. Thanks to a confuse ray miss, a dream eater, and another confuse ray, I have set up three sharpens by the time she swaps out into Golbat. At this point, I can't have the Golbat cancel out all my badge boosts, otherwise everything I've done up to this point will have been a waste. I fight through the confusion, and the first Psybeam confirms it will be a two hit. Luckily for us, it tries to double confuse us, and it fails. Confusion picks the perfect turn to run out, and the next Psybeam takes care of the pesky Golbat. Gengar manages to cooperate with us using two useless Dream Eaters, and is fully paralyzed for the third attack, which means we're able to finish setting up. Now that we're fully powered up, it's time to go on the offensive, and finish it off with a Psybeam. Unfortunately, it's not enough to do the two-thirds we need, but she super potions and we make our way to the next Pokemon. Hunter is out next, and our side beam doesn't take care of it in one hit, and she manages a hypnosis. Sleep is devastating in Gen 1. Luckily for us, we're only asleep the one turn and wake up, only taking damage from a single Nightshade. Arbok is next, and it's a nice reprieve from the challenges we've faced so far, and one side beam is more than enough to take it out. Last up is Gengar, and we see a Psybeam doesn't do more than half damage, but at least we importantly outspeed. It just uses a Nightshade, and we know the battle is won. Three attempts is pretty good for Agatha. Next up is Lance, but before then we make sure to say goodbye to Psybeam, and teach Blizzard in its place. I then use two PP ups, and this is when you see a glitch on screen. The program I'm using has an error that's been fixed at the time of writing the script. The PP will be a little bit off for Blizzard, but don't worry, it doesn't actually affect the game. Lance starts off with a Gyarados, and even though its moves aren't super effective against us, both Hydro Pump or Hyper Beam can still crit and take us out in a single hit. I struggle to set up my Sharpens while having to use Recover any time my HP drops too low. He even does manage to get a crit with a Hydro Pump after a few Sharpens and gets us down to 1 HP, meaning that without the badge boost, the run would have ended right there. Eventually, we do get to six sharpens and use one thunderbolt and unsurprisingly it goes down. The following two Dragonairs are a simple one shot with Blizzard, with no misses. Can we take a moment to notice that Dragonite's line are the only Pokemon in this game with the dragon typing? Also, interestingly enough, there's only one dragon move in the entire game and it's Dragon Rage, a 40 damage set move. So it's just funny that one of Dragon's only two weaknesses is really not a weakness at all so it's really just ice. Up next is Aerodactyl, and I'm quite surprised I outsped it at 170 speed versus my 89. Let's do a bit of math here, because that seems to be wrong. 89 times 1.125 equals 100. That's without any sharpens. Then it's 112, 126, 142, 160, 180. I guess the math does check out. Crazy. Unfortunately, all that speed is removed thanks to the level up right there. 
Dragonite outspeeds and finishes me off with a Hyper Beam. The next attempt goes a little different than that. That Gyarados battle took too long, so I just use two Sharpens and finish it off with a Thunderbolt. The next two Dragonairs also go down in one hit as expected. At this point, I forget about how fast Aerodactyl is, but luckily it only goes for a takedown, and then we take it down. Alright, rematch time with the Dragonite, and we just have to hope that it doesn't hit us with Hyper Beam, because there's just nothing I can do to stop it. It goes for agility, and this is all over. After this battle, I forget to set up for Champ the Champion, and I start this next one at level 57. Pidgeot comes out and we start setting up our Sharpens, but this time, with Recover, it's a bit easier than my previous runs. After three Sharpens in, I realize that I don't actually have a physical move for Alakazam, and that I didn't use my last rare candy. I then use a Thunderbolt and work my way to Alakazam as quickly as possible, as the clock is ticking. As you might expect, my attacks don't do much damage, and it makes quick work of me. The next attempt I make sure to teach Tri-Attack over Recover, and use my rare candies to make sure I don't level up in the middle of battle. The next battle starts and we start setting up our sharpens as usual. However, due to some better move choices and lack of recover, I decide after 4 and the start of the next sky attack setting up, this is the time to take Pidgeot out with Thunderbolt. Alakazam comes up and quick math during editing, I find out Porygon is up to 165 speed and that's the reason I get to go first with Tri-Attack. As Rhydon comes out, I can tell you that if I had used three Sharpens, I would have been at 147 and probably would have been finished off with a Psychic. Executor is quite a tank at 167 special, and in hindsight, despite the weakness to Ice, Tri-Attack would probably have finished it off with all of the Sharpens I had set up. I do take another chance at a Sharpen when I know Hypnosis is a risk. Gyarados was never in question thanks to its 4 times weakness to electric attacks. I unfortunately level up and this will make the battle with the Charizard anything but trivial. Charizard comes out and it uses Rage. So we win! We just take 2 turns here to finish him off, making us the Pokemon Champ. We finish the game at level 59 with 113 real time and 422 game time, and 12 resets. Since I mentioned all of those other attempts so much, it's only fair that I mention how I did in those attempts. My first attempt I finished at 2.20 real time and 59 resets. My second attempt I finished at 1.37 real time and 28 resets. My third attempt, since you're seeing my fourth, was 1.24 real time, 4.46 game time, and 17 resets. I did get slightly better each time as I figured out better paths, better moves, and when not to pick things up. Porygon is only my third Pokemon to complete the game with, so I don't exactly know where to stick it on my tier list. It was better than Butterfree, but not as good as Alakazam. I'm going to stick it in A tier for now. Over time, I may or may not swap Pokemon a tier based on my experiences. Porygon struggles at Brock, requiring a bit of power leveling up to 13. Then it's pretty good if you do things in a good order. I was even able to arrive at the league at a pretty low level, and needed to make up the difference with some rare candies to make sure the Elite Fork me made consistent. I think it's a pretty good Pokemon, and definitely a Pokemon I wouldn't consider bad thanks to the moves it can learn. I would like to think that it is indeed worth the 9,999 coins that it costs in red and yellow, if you're willing to obtain enough money to get it, or, god forbid, you gamble until you get the money. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, the next Pokemon will be selected at random. The next Pokemon will be... Beedrill. Again, I'd like to point out that I am only doing this until I get enough comments of Pokemon suggestions. Then I'll just do what people suggest the most. Unless, of course, people suggest Pokemon like Weedle or Ditto. Those will be saved for when we hit a massive achievement like a thousand subs, or a video with like 200 likes. If you have any suggestions for Pokemon, ways to improve my strategy, maybe even ways to improve my video quality, or even just to start a meme like how Scott's Thoughts chat uses Dennis, feel free to let me know in the comments section below. My channel is always improving and every video I plan to bring even better content. Keep the suggestions coming and I look forward to bringing you another video in hopefully two weeks with Beedrill.